The dust is finally starting to settle from a wild NHL free agency. Hunter and I have you guys covered. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday edition of the Locked On NHL show. If you're watching down in the States, happy Independence Day. I'm Nick Zararis, host of Locked On Oilers. That is Hunter Hodes, one of the hosts of Locked On Penguins. I want to thank everybody who makes Locked On NHL their first listen of the day. Locked On NHL, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. So, very busy show. Going to do our best to get in as much as we can because we've had a whole lot of news in the last week since we last talked to you guys. So, starting out with the big picture, the story of free agency is there was a lot of money in the system. You know, every team got a free five million dollars because the cap actually went up like it was supposed to. And teams spent very, very liberally. So you have teams like Nashville signing three marquee free agents, Seattle signing two expensive big name free agents. There were real opportunities from teams that were kind of in the middle of the pack. I think that was my biggest takeaway is that teams that were close to the middle, whether they were right on the bubble or just in the playoffs, they saw free agency and that new money in the system as an opportunity to say, we can get better right now. Boston kind of did the same thing that you knew they were going to get Lynn home. That had been rumor Nick for the last several months. Like, Oh, if he makes it to free agency and doesn't sign back with Vancouver, Boston's going to go after him. They sure did. They gave him quite a bit of money and quite a bit of term. Same thing with Zadorov. They gave him a lot of money and a lot of term. It makes them better. And I especially think tougher a little bit on the blue line. I know those are pretty hefty contracts, but I do think this makes them better, at least in the short term. Long term, we'll have to see how those contracts pan out, but we got to throw Boston in there as well. But Nashville, man, I think at worst, they're the number three team in the Central heading into next season, strictly behind Dallas and Colorado. Stamkos, that's a big contract for him. I think he's earned it after the year he just had in Tampa Bay. The one move that I think I was puzzled by with the Predators, Nick, was the Brady Shea contract. I don't think he's worth seven times seven in free agency, but you know Barry Trotz seems to think he was. But that's a team that is strictly going for it next year. They just signed UC Soros also to that massive long-term extension. They're trying to win now with him still being one of the five best goaltenders in the league. Trotz is a very fun GM. I'll give him that, man. It was really fun seeing him dish out all that money on July 1. And, you know, I'm actually going to be excited to watch more Predators games next season. I don't really think the Predators were, I guess, that good this past season. I figured they would be a first round exit to Vancouver once they got in. But next season, I can definitely see them winning a round, if not two, if they get the right matchup in round two overall. But really nice day from Nashville. And then, yeah, Seattle. I like the Montour contract. The one that gives me pause, though, is the Chandler Stevenson contract. I think that's a little too much term and I think a little too much money for him overall. But I get why Seattle did it, because they want to get back to the playoffs next season. The one, the one thing I will add on to what you just said, we got to start mentally recalibrating our brains to that the salary cap is a different number now. For so long, we've been in the low 80s. And now that it's 88 and a half, I do agree with you. I think 7 million is probably a little too much for what Shea is, being that he's probably going to play second pair matchup minutes as opposed to first pair running your power play. And it's really hard to justify paying your paying not your best defenseman more than six or seven million dollars a year because they're never going to get the counting stats. That's the thing with paying defensemen. If you're not pay if you're paying somebody other than your first power play quarterback seven, eight, nine million dollars, the contract is never going to look great because we associate value with counting stats. We associate value with offensive production. And Brady Shea is not usurping Roman Yossi on the Predators power play. So he's not going to put up 50, 60, 70 points. Could he be a solid matchup defenseman? Yes. I do think uh, to make the joke, if I had a nickel for every time Brady Shea was asked to replace Ryan McDonough, I would have two nickels. That's not a lot, but it is weird that it's happened twice because this has happened before. It happened with the Rangers. They said, we'll make Shea our McDonough of the future. Ultimately, they got cold feet on that contract, traded him before his no movement clause kicked in. 
I am weary of buying players from certain teams. I would be very weary about acquiring anybody who's played for Carolina that's not Jake Gensel. I would be very apprehensive about any of the defensemen from Florida going outside of the Florida system. I just, teams that have such strong underlying numbers at, on a team level, it's really hard to distill out individual performance from the team wide impact, especially something like Carolina, where Shea was playing with Pesci. They were a matchup pair and their forward group is committed to playing really high level defense. And it's the same thing with Florida. I Montour is a strong skater, which should mitigate some of the offset of going away from a strong possession team like Florida to Seattle, where he's going to be asked to play a little more defense. But it's going to be fundamentally different. And that brings me to one of my favorite. This is my favorite talking point every year in free agency. Just because a player is good somewhere does not necessarily mean they're going to be good when you bring them into your team. In a vacuum, I agree with you. I understand what Seattle was trying to do in bringing in Chandler Stevenson. He fits their team identity. They like to cycle. They like to dump and chase. Dump and chase guys, they start to lose their foot speed at some point. And Chandler Stevenson, he's got a lot of miles. He's a little bit, he's up there. He's 30. He's played a lot of games, been through a lot of playoffs, and that accumulates. Can he be, you know, a second line wing? Probably, but for how long? And that's where you start to get into the issue. But then again, the counterpoint to that is in free agency, you are never going to feel great. Most of these contracts, the minute you sign them, you know, okay, the back three years of this are going to be bad. Or we're paying this guy at least a million, if not two million too much per year. Or we had to give no trade protection to keep the AAV down. And one last thing I wanted to say before we move along here, and because we're going to talk mostly conference by conference in the next two segments, so we're going to bank some time from the first segment to get there, guys. So the one last thing I wanted to touch on, I don't think people understand what Tampa Bay was trying to do. They were not trying to insult Steven Stamkos by giving him eight years times three million. They were trying to give him a contract that would give him close to the same amount of value that he would get on a short-term deal. So that way they could still add stuff to the team. That was the point of trying to give Stamkos only. They don't care about loyalty in that situation. To them, it was about the team. And I know a lot of Lightning fans are very upset about that, but that's the reality of the situation. To them, it's all about the team. Uh, We all know how great Stamkos has been there for so long, but they they wanted to do a contract that they felt was, I guess, close to fair for them. I know they wanted to do short or lesser money for longer term, but Stamkos feels like he wants the opposite, you know, shorter term, more money. It's his right to want that. And he got it from Nashville, but the lightning, I understand what they did. You know, you trade out Sergachev, you bring in Gensel, you let Stamkos go. At least they're going to have a very good first line. But I think overall, you look up and down that team. I just don't think they're as deep heading into this season as they have been in years past. No, and they got a lot of miles, too. Just if we're going to be objective, that Tampa Bay team has so many miles, the guys they've acquired over the years. So that'll do it for the opening salvo of this episode of Locked On NHL. When we come back, we're going to tackle the Eastern Conference, what it's looking like, and a whole lot more. So be sure to stick around. It's summer. If you're watching on YouTube, you can probably see the thin layer of sweat that's building on my forehead as we record this episode. It's hot outside. That means two things. That means baseball. That means concerts. And if you want to get out there to a game or show this summer, you have got to check in with our friends over at Game Time. I'm going to two baseball games. I'm going to a baseball game today while you're watching this episode on Thursday. And I'm going to a baseball game tomorrow on Friday. I got my tickets for both games from Game Time, featuring some of the best tools in the ticket buying industry. Things like zone deals, where you choose a section and let Game Time choose the seats. All in pricing, where they show you the total up front with no surprise fees at checkouts. My personal favorite, the seat view, where you get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. You actually want to be able to see the field. You would like to see home plate if you're at a baseball game to get an idea if the umpire is calling ball and strikes fairly. The lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Game time ticket coverage. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N H L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price 
guaranteed. Thank you to everybody listening to today's edition of Locked On NHL. So we're going to do our best to get through this as fast as we can because there's a whole lot to talk about and we don't want to leave any teams out. So starting back in the Eastern Conference. So the Rangers finished in first in the East last year. Their only move of note, bringing in Riley Smith on a relatively reasonable contract because Pittsburgh retained some money. You would like to have not given up a second round pick considering the Rangers just don't have a lot of draft picks. But Riley Smith's better than what they had at that spot. That's fine. It, it doesn't really move the needle, but it's fine. I think with him, he, the Rangers are a very rush-based offense team, so I think he could work there if he does have a bit of a bounce back here. He had a real good first month with the Penguins, especially next to Evgeny Malkin, but after that, it just went downhill really quickly. He's got to rediscover his scoring touch a little bit if that's going to work in New York. But again, with the way the Rangers play, especially offensively, I think that has a decent chance of working overall for this season. Yeah, I, I I see the fit. I see the vision. And he was cheap. That was important. Yeah. Carolina, they lost Shea. They lost Pesci. They lost Gensel. They extended um, Jalen Chatfield. But now it seems like they may or may not have to suck up their pride and figure it out with Marty Natchez because I think they were thinking they were going to be able to trade him because they were going to keep Gensel. Now it feels like I don't know. They also extended Slavin, that massive yes. contract that he got. I'm kind of worried about Carolina heading into next year. I still think they're a playoff team. Don't get me wrong. I think they're going to finish top three in the Metro. But man, Nick, they just they still need more scoring. You lost yeah. all those players during free agency. You don't have a replacement for Gensel. What's going to happen with Natchez if you trade him? Who you're going to get in return? And that's also another 25 to 30 goal score that you don't have on your team. Who are you replacing? If you trade Natchez and you also lose Gensel to free agency, which they did, he went to Tampa Bay. So that's my big question for Carolina. Where is the scoring coming from outside of Ajo, outside of Svechnikov, you know, outside of Slavin, a little bit, a couple of other players in the lineup as well? I still think this team really needs another top finisher if they want to go deep in the playoffs. Agreed with you. Florida, they lose Brandon Montour. They lose Oliver Ekman Larson. They do take care of Sam Reinhart, who stayed on pretty, pretty reasonable contract, in all honesty. I thought he probably could have gotten more out on the open market. Uh, you'll see if Florida has the Stanley Cup hangover or not. They definitely they brought in Nate Schmidt on a really cheap deal because he wanted to be there. There was conjecture out there. A couple They made a few calls on guys who ended up signing in other places. But Florida... They are going to piecemeal together their defense. I do think losing Montour hurts. I do think losing OEL hurts, but they're going to be fine. They're, those are not in. Those are not foundational pieces. You know, Carolina losing three guys and their entire second defensive pair, I think, is a bit more important than the guys Florida's lost. But I do expect Florida to take a slight step back. I think so too. They're also still, I think, talking to Vladimir Tarasenko yes. about a potential return. He's also been in contact with the Pittsburgh Penguins. I mean, I've been told by a reliable source that Evgeny Malkin is very much recruit recruiting him, excuse me, to come to Pittsburgh, but that came after Josh Yoey of the Athletic reported that the Penguins are interested in signing him. I think a bunch of other teams are as well. Another thing to watch for for this offseason with the Panthers, Nick, what does Anton Lindell's contract look like? Yeah. 22. Really good bottom six center. Curious to see how big of a pay raise he gets after the playoffs that he just had for the Panthers. Yeah, agreed with you. Um, next up on the list, the Bruins, who you mentioned, threw a bunch of money at free agents. They were trying to stop the bleeding. You know, they they've recognized they've been a little shallow in their lineup for a few years now. Last year, they got by with Geeky and Charlie Coyle. Lindholm probably isn't a first line center. At least he hasn't played as one in the last two seasons. It's better than what they had. This exactly. Time. You had to make a move there, man. They, they, did. they, they, no did. they were a boat that was sinking and they plugged the holes. It's probably not safe to keep sitting in this boat in the middle of the ocean, but they have they've plugged the holes for long enough that, OK, they'll probably be in about the same spot. They'll flirt with 110 points. They'll probably finish second in the division behind Florida. They'll be fine. They won't be a Stanley Cup contender, but they'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, they'll be a playoff team, but yeah, yeah, I mean, heading into this season, you needed at least another top six center after the way your centers looked this past season. Lindholm, yeah, he's 29. Yeah, he signed a pretty hefty contract, but he's better than what they had. The Zadorov contract, I got to admit, Nick, that one scares me a little bit. I know it's only $5 million per, but that term is for quite a while. I'm not sure if he's going to hold up during that time, but I feel like 
when you it look, doesn't matter at that point. That's yeah. the thing for them. Yeah, if they, there's a good chance they're just terrible by the end of that contract, and it doesn't really matter. That's true, but they also needed another defenseman because yeah. I look at that defensive group. I mean, they lost Grizzly, they, they lost the Forbor, Lynn Holmes, great, but they needed another guy there overall. Yeah. Agreed with you for sure. Uh, next up, the Leafs. They did the piecemeal thing on the back end. They brought in OEL. They signed uh, Stolars to be the other goalie in a tandem with Wool. I have no idea what they're doing in net. They have two guys who've never started more than 40 games in a tandem. I don't think that's a great idea, especially behind a defense that's not going to be good defensively. Uh, OEL had a nice bounce back season, but that's because he was playing third pair minutes in Florida on a good possession team. And the Leafs aren't a bad possession team, but not to the they're not as good as Florida was. And I do think you're not going to enjoy that contract. No, the, the Tanov contract is too much term. The money, yeah. I guess, is a bit better it's than fine. the term, but it's just too long of a contract, man. I feel yeah. like Chris Tanov well, is still a very productive player right now, especially in his own zone, but I just don't know how long that's going to hold up. And we did forget Nick. They did sign Max Domi. I think that's honestly a really sound yeah. year for the Maple Leafs. He had a pretty good year this past year. I think if his goal scoring goes up, it looks even better, but he still had 47 points this past season. So, you know, having that as a middle six to you know, potentially a third line player. I- I'll take that any day. Obviously, the big question still remains with Toronto. What happens with Mitch Marner? But that's a question I think we're going to be asking for the next several months at this point. But I still see Toronto as at least a playoff team heading into next season. Agreed with you. Tampa Bay, we touched on the Stamkos and Gensel thing, and they traded for Ryan McDonough earlier in the summer. They'll be fine. They'll be a, they should be a playoff team. But I don't have high expectations for that group. As you mentioned, they're very shallow. They they have two lines. They have one good defensive pair. And yes, they did bring back Ryan McDonough, but Ryan McDonough is also like 34 now. So I don't know how realistic it is to say, yeah, you're going to play 1,200 minutes this year for us. Yeah, I mean, Point Kucherov, Point Kucherov, excuse me, and Gensel, that's a really fun first line. They're going to score a lot of goals. You have yeah. Brandon Hagel also in that lineup. He's still a very productive player. Sorelli, I think, is still pretty decent in his own right. But after that, again, you look at that forward group overall, it's just kind of shallow at this point. Victor Hedman, he signed that massive extension. He's still very, very good. And then you have Andre Vasilevsky. He's still one of the five best goaltenders on the planet. I think that core in general is good enough to make the playoffs. I just think their days of being a bona fide contender, at least right now, are over in my opinion. Definitely agree with you there. Uh, The Islanders, they took care of their one of their holes. They brought in Duclair. Good contract, not a lot of term. I like that fit a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's that's I think that's one of the best contracts of day one of free agency. And of course, it comes from Lou Lamorello, of all people, who loves dishing out term to a lot of players on that team. But that's a really nice fit for the Islanders. They needed more scoring heading into this season. Duclair will provide that in a top six or middle six role. I still think they could use another score in that lineup. Lou always likes to work in secrecy overall, but I do really like that move for the Islanders. And then the last team to make the playoffs, Washington, who made quite a few moves over the last handful of days. And they're not just going to go into the end of the Ovechkin era lying down. Uh, Very interesting decisions. I liked the ideas. I see what they're trying to do, and they should be better than they were. They improved the roster. Their front office is very savvy. I really like how Brian McClellan does things down in D.C. The Jacob Chikrin deal is a steal. Ottawa really just did not get much back for him at all. I do that deal every time if I'm Washington. Matt Roy, I really like that deal for Washington as well. You you also get Brandon Duhame. So they're filling out their forward depth a little bit better this year compared to last year. You have Logan Thompson as the backup now. I, I definitely think heading into next season, I was not high on the Capitals heading into the season before July 1 started, but I definitely think they have a good shot at making the playoffs As things stand right now, obviously, I know Backstrom's not going to be there. We have to see what happens with TJ Oshie. Does he retire this year just because of his problems with his back and everything? But I do think Washington has improved heading into next year, and they at least want to be a playoff team for Ovechkin's final two years, two years, excuse me, under contract. That definitely seems like it's the goal for them. All right, that will do it for our conversation about the Eastern Conference playoff teams. After the break, we're going to come back. We're going to tackle the West, the Oilers. We're very busy plenty to talk about. Hello, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for being here. If you are enjoying this on your Thursday and down here in the States, 
Happy Independence Day. Hopefully safe, fun weekend ahead. Off tomorrow. Beautiful thing when you can squeeze in a four day weekend. Okay. Dallas finished first. Uh, Dallas got worse. No other way around it. Dallas got worse. They lost guys. And that's the thing. When you're a good team, you can't afford to keep everybody who's good. Yeah. I mean, I still think this team is a bona fide contender heading into next year. I know, obviously, not having Tanev, not having Pavelski. You know, they also traded Roddick Foxa to the Blues, but that was kind of just a salary dump anyway. But I still think when you look at this core overall, it's one of the best teams in the league. I think they're mostly going to be fine heading into next season. I love the Duchesne contract, man. That is another yep. steal for them. They continue to get Duchesne on a steal of a contract. I still think this team, even though they got a little bit worse during free agency, I still think they're going to be fine heading into next season. Yes, big picture, they will be fine, but they lost some of the cornerstones of their depth. That's what made them so right. dangerous. You know, Pavelski, I thought Joe Pavelski would be scoring 25 goals till I was 65 years old because it kind of seemed like it didn't matter. He was still, he wasn't as effective as he'd been in the last few years this past season, but he was still better than, you know, 70% of the players in the NHL. Uh, moving along, Vancouver. Uh, they got a lot bigger on the back end, but that's really all I can say. You know, they gave Ronick the long term extension. They signed Tyler Myers. They signed Vinny DeArnay. They gave Dakota Joshua an extension. They brought in Jake DeBrusque. I like the DeBrusque idea. A bona fide goal scorer to ride shotgun with Pedersen or with JT Miller. Of the moves they made, he's the one I like the most. I don't see what they're trying to do on defense, but other than that, I mean, they're talented enough where as long as Demko plays reasonably well, they should be fine. See, I like Jake DeBrus quite a bit, but seven years times 5.5 good? I just don't know, man. I think that's a little too much for my taste for someone who, yeah, can play in your top six, but I think I see him more as a middle six player overall. I don't know. The, the term just kind of scares me. Recalibrate your brain, Hunter. Remember, five and a half million in this cap is like, four and a half to four million in the old cap. So like, yes, Jake DeBrusque at that number sounds like a lot, but in the new cap percentage of cap, it's not nearly as bad as it sounds sticker price wise. That's at least fair. I understand yeah. you on that. But yeah, defensively, it is interesting that they continue to bring back Tyler Myers, even though I don't think he's that good anymore. I love the Danton Heinen signing two times 2.25 million. He was really good in Boston. Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvin obviously know him. So that makes a lot of sense. Dakota Joshua, again, that's a really nice contract, I think. But I think something might have to give here with Vancouver. They really don't have a lot of cap space right now. I'm curious to see if someone potentially calls maybe on Connor Garland. He has two years left on his contract at almost $5 million, $4.95 million for two years overall. Does someone call on him after the year he just had? I'm curious to see if they make a move like that to open up some more cap space for heading into next season. That was the rumor floating around that they were considering trading him at the deadline. So I could see them doing that to make some more cap space. Next up, the Winnipeg Jets. They lose Tyler to Foley. They were in on Sean Monaghan, who opted to go to Columbus instead. Uh, they definitely are a forward or two short. They lost two defensemen, um, Nate Schmidt going to Florida, and then um, Dylan DeMello going to New Jersey, I think, if my brain remembers correctly. The, other than that, you know, the, the high-end guys are still good. They may or may not be shopping Nick Ehlers. Uh, they definitely need more guys. Yeah. They have young guys who might be ready to take leaps. Like, I don't know if they might be able to rectify the Rutger McGrody situation. We've been waiting on Vili Hanola forever. They have young guys. Uh, Brad Lambert might be ready to make the leap to the NHL this season. They have a lot of guys who can fill in those holes, but we know the Jets have been very reticent to give young guys opportunities. I like the Jets, but I feel like everything went right for them this regular right. season. They yeah. got into the playoffs, even though I really didn't think they were going to this season. I'm just a bit scared. Does everything go right for them next year again? We all know how good Shifley still is. Kyle Connor's great. Ehlers is still great. If he's going to be on the team, he's been a lot, a lot of trade rumors. I have follow. He's at 4 million. If he's able to stay healthy, I like him. Nina Ryder, that's still a solid contract. But yeah, I, I still feel like they need more scoring up front. Overall, I like Morrissey at his cap hit, but I still feel like they need another top defenseman for that group. You know, Neil Pionk, okay. I mean, he's fine, but I still don't think he's a bona fide top pairing guy no. at this point. I mean, goaltender wise, you know what you're going to get from Connor Hellebuck. I'll be curious to see who wins that backup job between Comrie and Kokkinen. That's an interesting battle heading into training camp, but they still need more scoring up front. And I think they need 
another top four defenseman heading into next season. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Edmonton next up, very busy in free agency. Skinner, I like the vision there. Arvidsson, I like what they're doing. And then they kept a whole bunch of their UFAs. They gave Corey Perry probably a little bit more than I would have. But other than that, it's hard to really complain about any of the moves. They probably are trying to find a way to move Evander Kane. Unsure if they're going to be able to do that. They're going to have to attach a sweetener to that to make that happen. And there, are, there is some conjecture that they're trying to move Cody Ceci. Part of why they signed two right-handed defensemen to m- prepare for the possibility that they trade Cody CC and need to have kind of an open competition for that last spot. But Edmonton improved their forward depth and they didn't lose anyone important on the back end. Uh, Calvin Pickard as a backup might be a little concerning. They might be in the market for a more dependable backup, but they had a nice day and they got nobody crazy, nobody really expensive and nobody on bad term. I really like that Arvidsson deal, man. That's a really nice deal for a middle six player. Love the Jeff Skinner contract. I think he has a real chance to bounce back. And Edmonton also obviously has a chance to win a Stanley Cup with how good the Oilers are going to be heading into next season. But that was my biggest concern heading into free agency with them was their forward group. Just this past season as a whole, it just felt like when McDavid and Drysaddle, you know, and Hyman and company, when they weren't out there, they were just getting caved in. Well, now you have Skinner in the fold. Now you have someone like Arvidsson who can score in the fold as well. They improve their forward depth. That's most important for them heading into next season. They got better. I really liked what the Oilers did. Overall, you also bring back Matthias Janmark. He had really good playoffs for the Oilers. Connor Brown was great in the playoffs. Can he take that momentum into the regular season? We'll have to see. But all in all, I think that was a pretty sound day for Edmonton. Again, I really love the Arvidsson and the Skinner moves. Next up, Colorado. I mean, their big move, uh, re-signing Drew in, bringing in Eric Brandstrom. They signed a few other guys to depth contracts, but the they're capped out. It, there's no other way to say it. The Avalanche are entirely capped out. They are going to need to get very creative going forward to maintain a window of, consi- a window of contendership because yeah. Landeskog, probably not coming back. Nichushkin, I don't think they're going to... De- trust him enough to give him another opportunity whenever he leaves the player assistance program they probably try and find a way to move along they just don't have a lot of free space i know there was some conjecture they might try and trade ross colton to free up some space but unless they are they only have 10 forwards under contract right now as we sit here recording this episode on wednesday uh that includes two guys who you know i just mentioned in um nichushkin and landeskog aren't in those 10 so technically it's 12 but this is a capped out team. They've had to make some concessions on certain parts of their roster. As long as you have McKinnon and Ranton in, you'll be in the conversation. But I struggle to imagine they're going to be able to be a real contender with this current configuration. I love the Eric Brandstrom contract, 900K yes. for someone who I think has a lot of room to grow. But man, losing Walker from that defensive group, that's going to be, I think, a very underrated loss. He was real good in Colorado. I think he was one of the more underrated defenseman of this free agency class as a whole. So I really think Colorado is going to feel that loss, even though they do have Cam McCarr, they do have Devon Taves. I'm curious to see what happens with Landis Gog. I mean, during that presser, I feel like he still made it seem like he wants to come back and give it a shot and try and play this upcoming season. We'll just have to see if he's able to do that. If he can come back, that would be awesome just because of how great he is when he's fully healthy. But also, he's been out of the game for so long. How does he look coming back from such a severe injury. You brought up Ross Colton. Yeah, he's been involved, I think, in some trade rumors overall, whether you look at the insiders and all that stuff. They still need to open up some cap space at some point if they want to really improve this team heading into next year. The foundation is there. I think they're a playoff team, but I still think they need to make another move or two and open up some more cap space for that to happen. We talked about Nashville already in the opening segment. Very aggressive, trying to get back in the serious contender category. It's fine. Uh, Vegas lost important pieces from their cup run. They lost Marsha Show and they lost uh, Chandler Stevenson. And then uh, the Kings, they got out of the Dubois contract. They, for some reason, signed Joel Edmondson. They let Nick Roy walk. Uh, they replaced Victor Arvidsson with Warren Fogle. Sure. I still don't know what the vision is in LA I don't for know Rob what the Blake. Plan is in LA for Rob Blake, man. Yeah. I really don't know what he's trying to do there. He's kind of just being a very odd general manager. It feels like he's flirting 
with trying to make the playoffs and contend versus trying to do a retool on the fly with some of these moves, right? So I don't really know what the plan is. Vegas has been very quiet so far, and I feel like that's going to change at some point. You don't, hey, man, the, this, the rumor out there, they, they want to try on Marner if, if the Leafs actually trade him. I, I wouldn't be shocked. Move if they're able to pull it off, but I'm just letting everyone know Vegas has been very quiet, and I think that's going to change at some point. I definitely think there's a move to be made there. You got to remember they made their big moves at the deadline. Yeah. You know, they, they brought in Hannafin and Hurdle very well could be right back in the mix for t- best team in the Western conference. They're probably going to have to figure out some things as far as depth, their goaltending situation does raise a few questions. I was very curious why they didn't, they didn't tender a Kira Schmidt at offer considering they don't really have a young goalie in the pipeline, but whatever. Um, that will just about do it for today's edition of Locked On NHL. So if you could be so kind, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. If you're on Apple or Spotify, throw the show a five-star review. If you are watching over on YouTube, let us know in the comments. What free agent signing did you like the best that your team took care of over the last handful of days? Subscribe, hit the alarm bell so you get a notification whenever a new episode goes live. Hunter and I will talk to you guys next week.